Uh, good evening, Darlene. Thanks for leading the discussion. So this is a, a, a unique case that was written about. Yeah, I think that uh, in the American literature, um, we often um, aren't looking for bandwidth. We hear this particular syndrome is in Europe. It's related to the ticks in Europe. And we don't get as many cases that are written about. So this is an American case where they talked about the uh, Bandworth and, and how to get to know uh, what to look for to call it Bandworth. Well, let's back up a second. What, what causes this syndrome? Well, in, in this case, Bandworth is uh, from Lyme disease. And so uh, in America, we talk about a certain type of Borrelia um, that, that Dr. Brigdorfer discovered called Borrelia Brigdorferi. But there's a other kind of species in Europe um, called Brillia Abzale and Brillia garinii. And so those particular species we think leads to this. So it's a, it's a neurologic problem that uh, is occurring in America. We just don't often, often uh, diagnose it. So we're, are we, we're, there's still questionable what ticks tra can transmit this? It seems like the same ticks that we get from Lyme disease and it's actually one of the ways Lyme disease shows up. You know, we're so used to Bell's palsy where the face is down, down or meningitis, a rash, uh, a swollen knee, but there's always different neurologic type presentations that people have. And so over time, you know, we get so much in the habit of talking about the average everyday disease from a, a tick. And in this case, uh, it shows you that there's other types of presentations, other types of neurologic bring things that get overlooked. This just happens to be called Bandworth syndrome. And in this case, it, it occurred very early in the disease. So that's why they called it early disseminated. So even when you're just expecting something easy and straightforward, in this case, it shows you how complicated um, somebody with Lyme disease can have it. In this case, the, the man came to the emergency room with you know, generalized myalgias, fatigue, and stiff neck, um, back pain, headache, stiff neck. And the doctor uh, wasn't thinking of neurologic uh, syndrome called Bandworth syndrome. They weren't thinking about Lyme disease. Uh, they decided it must be pneumonia. But once he got treated for pneumonia, his symptoms worsened. The, um, the story got uh, interesting uh, as the authors uh, discussed that uh, the symptoms started after two tick bites while he was performing yard work. And so uh, given he was failing treatment for pneumonia and he had those two ticks and he had a particular type of neurologic problem, it completely changed the direction of treatment for this uh, doctor and their patient. Yeah, they ran, they ran several tests. Can you talk to us about a, a few of those tests that, that were positive and, and what the significance is of each of those? Well, they, the, an extra finding that they had uh, in this particular study, uh, in this particular patient, is that he had pain that went down his entire spine uh, upper and lower arms and legs, and, uh, and there was right arm weakness. And he also had some urinary retention, that is he couldn't uh, uh, empty his bladder. So when you put together pain, weakness, and bladder problems, that's the kind of uh, thing you have, uh, that's the kind of neurologic thing you have when you have Bandworth syndrome. So uh, answering your question is that clinically there was something wrong, uh, but the pain was eight out of 10, um, which is uh, 
you know, got a good deal of pain. He had paraspinal tenderness. That is when the, in the, they examined his back and found right along that spine that was tender. The reflexes on your toes were decreased. So not only was the story right, the exam was right, but the blood test uh, um, showed uh, what they call a high sedimentation rate or ESR of 100. So anytime someone has um, that high a sed rate, uh, then uh, there must be some inflammation going on. And the C-reactive protein was also up. The way sed rate works is they take a, a tube of blood and let it settle over an hour. And if it settles like 10 millimeters this much, it's fine, or maybe 20 millimeters, maybe 30 millimeters. But whenever you get 100, that's typically a, a serious infection. And they also, they also uh, ran the Western blot and ELISA tests as well, right, for, for Lyme disease. And what, did, what were those findings? Well, they, they often, um, you know, order these Lyme tests. And, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a day or two to come back. But in this case, the, the patient actually had a positive Lyme test called an ELISA and a positive Western blot that confirmed early stage Lyme which must have been that it was IgM, which is the first responders rather than, than IgG. And they also, um, given the, how sick this patient was, they did a spinal tap and they described lymphocytic pleocytosis, which, is, which means pleocytosis are cells more cells than you expect in the spinal fluid. And lymphocytic means the lymphocytic type cells that you get. And that's one of the few findings in a spinal tap that you can count on. Uh, back when they were describing neurologic Lyme disease in 1990, pleocytosis was used to diagnose Lyme disease. And so therefore, uh, not only was an exam proper, the history was proper, now that you get confirmation, when you get all of those findings in one place, you end up uh, having an opportunity to publish a case. You know, not everybody has all of those pieces, but fortunately with everything in place, uh, they uh, were able to write about it and uh, give us a better understanding what Banner syndrome is. So fortunately, his, his clinical symptoms and the tests supported this diagnosis? Yes, they had decided that um, three things that it really defined it. Severe radiculopathy, which means pain, unexpected pain running down uh, an extremity or down the back, and upper extremity weakness, and urinary dysfunction. If you have all three of those, that's considered pathognomonic. That means that's all you need. Those three things alone by history. Uh, and by exam uh, is Banworth. Now, in this case, they weren't completely sure what caused the, uh, the bladder problems because they weren't sure if uh, the radicular pain was because the uh, spirochetes were in the bladder wall or the Lyme that was affecting the nerves. Uh, they know, they know um, this was a, something from Lyme disease. And so they elected to treat. And that, what, can you tell us what that treatment was? Well, they decided that uh, this treatment for a neurologic Lyme disease is typically intravenous ceftriaxone. The brand name in America is Rosefa. And within 20 days, he had uh, improvement and resolution of his urinary retention. Now, they didn't address uh, whether there was any other symptoms that remained other than urinary retention. They didn't say whether or not the radicular pain was better. But since this is early disease, they seem to recognize it during this admission, um, it's common to have a very good outcome with early treatment. Uh, I'm always concerned because there's other things in a tick like anaplasmosis and Babesia that you wouldn't uh, be treating with intravenous ceftriaxone. So 
I always like to have people follow up after 21 days or 30 days of treatment to make sure there's no other disease, a tick-borne disease manifestation. Now that the authors um, describe what the, kind of the common symptoms of Van Gorff syndrome are, can you go into that a little bit? Well, I think that um, when one looks at uh, literature, you know, we always focus in on three things uh, for bandwidth, you know, the radicular pain, the upper extremity weakness, and uh, the uh, bladder problems. But if you actually look at it in an organized way, they had, uh, they also had the things you typically see with Lyme disease, uh, like many of them had sleep problems, headaches, tiredness, malaise, uh, numbness and tingling, peripheral nerve palsy, uh, meningeal signs, paresis. So it's quite a list. So some of the ones that stand out on that list that uh, we don't always look for is paresis. Um, and, uh, but everything else is uh, something that uh, we see in Lyme. So sometimes if they present with all those other things, you might be able to pick up Lyme disease uh, based on other findings, not just radicular pain. In fact, the pain that this, uh, this syndrome can cause is similar to a zoster-like pain. Uh, herpes zoster is um, you know, the shingles that people uh, uh, find severely painful. And this type of pain they're talking about, bandwidth, uh, are similar. So the, uh, they also described as an author that the pain was burning, stabbing, biting, or tearing, and usually responds poorly to all this analgesics. So I think that's also the frustration with shingles. That's all also burning, stabbing, biting, and uh, this type of thing. It's a good thing that they responded to um, intravenous rocephin so they could avoid uh, uh, suffering. And uh, so the author's conclusion was uh, pretty understandable. They said, if you have a, all of these neurologic symptoms, particularly after a recent or a suspected tick bite, that should prompt a thorough re evaluation for Lyme neuro neuroborreliosis and an assessment for a Banworth syndrome. And so I agree, you know, this is, uh, these kind of case studies just remind us to uh, put the whole story together and then make sure that that Lyme disease is on the, on the list. Now, what would you say makes this case unique? Is it the urinary retention um, symptom that was, the patient was experiencing or? I think there were two things that were important. One is the urinary retention. So urologists uh, evaluation, um, if they look broader than the bladder, they might have made the, the diagnosis uh, and, uh, and at least referred to uh, the patient, to a, a specialist, uh, and maybe it mentioned to the patient that the, at least bladder things can cause it. Um, all of those other signs and symptoms that were showing up uh, would have helped with the diagnosis. Uh, and the other thing that's important is, is we often overlook radicular pain, this severe pain as, that's as bad as zoster type pain. And that particular kind of problem, um, you know, we're so focused on fatigue and concentration and headaches is that, that if that patient is suffering with eight out of 10 pain at least, is that uh, this reminds us that Lyme can do some pretty um, painful, pretty frustrating uh, things. And it's uh, always good that uh, since Lyme disease can mimic disease, it's always good to at least keep Lyme disease as a consideration. Well, thank you so much again for, for speaking with us and covering this case. It's very interesting. And the uh, viewers can read more about uh, this topic and others on your site at danielcameronmd.com.